All right, thank you everybody for joining today. I appreciate your attendance in person and online today. Um, this is the Ditch the Glitch panel. We're gonna to talk to you about the ever exciting uh, topic of latency, which many of you will not know about. And if you do, you probably misunderstand it. So we're gonna go into that. Um, everybody loves to talk about uh, broadband speed, 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 you know, gigabit per second symmetric. Um, that, as it turns out, isn't necessarily the most important thing. So we've got a great panel for you today. And um, we, we've got uh, folks here. I am Jason Livingood from Comcast. I'm the Vice President of Technology Policy Product and Standards. And um, the panelists um, that we have today, we have Dominique uh, Lazansky. She works on international governance and cybersecurity policy and has become an expert on things like mobile device security and standards development. And she works on a variety of projects for her company, Last Press Label, and uh, just finished her PhD. Um, and uh, congratulations on Thanks. that. That's never <laughs> an easy thing. Um, she's also an amateur biathlete uh, and roller ski and Nordic coach. So as you'll find out, everybody <laughs> on this panel is athletic in some way, shape, or form, um, including myself. Next up, we have uh, Nick Feemster who's the Neubauer Professor of Computer Science and the Director of Research at the Data Science Institute at the University of Chicago. And that is a long title, that's quite a mouthful. Um, he focuses his research on many aspects of computer networking and network systems, particularly network operations, security, and censorship resistant communication systems. He's also an avid distance runner and has completed more than 20 marathons, which is quite an achievement, so kudos. <laughs> Um, next, we have uh, Erman. Uh, Erman uh, Sakic is from NVIDIA. He's a senior software engineer there. Um, and surprising to see NVIDIA is not in the AI uh, presentation right now, <laughs> which is good. They're here. So take that for, for a sign of uh, where, what things are meaningful, I think, in terms of networking technology. At NVIDIA, he works on QE improvements and network routing for their glowing, growing cloud gaming service called GeForce Now, mm -hmm. and its mm -hmm. AR VR streaming stack, which is going to be the next thing that really grows rapidly for them. Um, he's also been at uh, Siemens, where he worked on real-time uh, or time-sensitive networks and real-time applications, and has a PhD from uh, University of uh, Technical University of, of Munich. Mm. And in his spare time, he runs half marathon, so he's not quite up to marathon oh distance yet. Oh <laughs> and reads uh, science fiction. And lastly, we have Mike Conlow. Um, he's the director of network strategy at Cloudflare. He helps measure internet performance and build their infrastructure around the world, advocating for things to help grow the internet, which is always good. Uh, before then, he's uh, focused on political technology, both at the Obama uh, campaign in 2012 and does deputy CTO. And in his spare time, he plays ice hockey <laughs> and works on many hobby projects, including uh, attending his community garden, which is great. So we've got um, an ice hockey player, uh, three runners, and then a runner and cyclist. So um, lots, of, uh, lots of fun stuff there. So let's um, dive into the slides. Um, so this is Ditch the Glitch. Um, I think you recognize things like that, but you might not recognize my dog. That's my dog, Luna. Um, got to know her even better during um, pan the pandemic. And the first thing you, that you'll know, especially if you've got great internet service at home during the pandemic, you probably still had Zoom problems. You probably had <laughs> little glitches. And the reason was lack of bandwidth. That's a clue to our panel. Um, so let's talk through exactly what latency is. So latency is an important thing, an important aspect of internet performance. <coughs> and essentially, it is very different from what people understand it to be. And I'll explain that in another slide. But really, it says that everything we know about internet performance is mostly wrong. We used to think that more speed, more bandwidth solved all ills on the internet. And it's true, speed is very important and it's always been a good proxy for quality of experience for users. But it is not the only key performance factor. And as we enter what I sort of call the era of bandwidth abundance or the post gigabit era, it is no longer the primary factor in user quality. Um, and that thing is latency. 
And almost every um, you know, problem that people experience is latency related these days, um, but uh, people don't really understand what that is. And so a lot of times when people think latency, that's sort of a nerdy kind of word maybe. Better, I think, to just think delay. No one likes to wait for something. No one wants to wait for content. No one wants to wait for something to load on their screen. And if you're doing something interactive in real time, you don't want to wait for those things. And that's important. Delay is really the most important thing. Uh, today, when policymakers in particular talk about latency, they talk about what's really idle latency. So it's when you run a round trip, you know, like a ping packet from point A to point B, and you see how long that takes. And to use an example, you know, fiber or DOCSIS networks might have latency on the order of 10 to 15 milliseconds. And you might think, wow, if one type of networking is 10 milliseconds of idle latency and another is 15, that's a huge difference, right? Doesn't matter, really, because working latency, which is the next one here, is on the order of hundreds of milliseconds of delay or thousands. So it could be a half a second or a second of delay. And if you think about a lot of web pages and applications doing multiple round trips, you then have all of that delay stacking up and causing real delay to the point that it's a several second delay in many cases. And that's why you notice occasional glitches in games or video conferences or what have you. <coughs> so that's the key thing is sort of you know, reframing what we think of uh, as latency. And so you know, this is hopefully about as nerdy as it's gonna get. This is a, <laughs> a distribution of delay and what the sources of the delay are. And that idle latency, that basic ping that someone runs, is really just testing the first two parts, the propagation delay. That's the speed of light on a fiber. You can't go faster unless you're maybe in outer space, um, which is you know, one of those cool kind of things. But you can't go faster than that. Interface delay is that protocol like PON or DOCSIS and so on. Again, you know, there's a certain amount of built-in delay in those protocols. But you know, those are what they are. Um, really, the highest that you would see is maybe uh, geostationary, you know, high orbit uh, satellite where you might see 100 milliseconds or more. Uh, but for most technologies, you know, you've got this negligible budget, you know, up the left side of it. But really, the big one is the queuing delay. What happens at the internet protocol layer in a computer that's trying to connect to the internet and send packets or in your home router or your Wi Fi network? And that is where, from a return on investment standpoint, the network community has been focused. And that is where all of the problems from a user standpoint occur today. And so that's, um, that's important. So at the IETF, which is the Internet Engineering Task Force, they've been focused on this new notion of dual queue networking. And so um, that's a, a new thing. And the first, I think, important aspect of this to understand is that on any end-to-end -end path from, say, your house out to content at Google or Cloudflare or NVIDIA or wherever, somewhere on that path, there's a bottleneck link, that link that is the most constrained. And that link is where this queue is going to build up, where the delay will become a factor. And so that is where um, the ITF and other networking organizations have been focused their research and development on to try to fix that. And so the great part about these standards, including active queue management, which is something that networks can deploy today, is that it can be incrementally deployed. It's not where you have to wait for everybody to support it before you can deploy, which is always good. Um, so that is a good thing. And there's also very loose coupling. So a network that might deploy dual queue networking or AQM can do so without having to do any coordination in particular with application vendors. Very different, I think, in contrast with sort of 5G network slicing, where there's a high degree of coordination uh, or other things where, where that happens. And I think in general, you know, the sort of way that the internet architecture succeeds is by having loose coupling. Um, and then from a net neutrality standpoint, you're, a lot of you are policy um, wonks. And for, for you, when you think about the policy aspects, you have the applications themselves that are marking their traffic, their packet headers. It's not the network doing that marking, and that's an important distinction from the net neutrality standpoint. Uh, at the same time, any app provider that can mark their traffic can do so. It's not that they have to get permission, they have to agree to some API terms of service, and so on. So that's another big aspect that um, is a little bit different from some existing things. 
And I'll mention very quickly, you know, Comcast has a field trial of low latency networking um, that's out in, in practice right now. We've been doing it since late summer. We've seen a, a basically a 50% reduction, in some cases more um, reduction in latency, which is amazing. Uh, really is transformative from a cloud gaming standpoint. And we think it's a, an important enabler for AR and VR experiences. Um, and uh, really any application that you can think of that involves interaction between user and a screen or a user and an AI device, um, you know, like a, you know, something along those lines. So with that, we'll go to our second um, slide deck. Quick question. Yes, quick question. Is this an open standard? It's a totally open standard, yes. Anybody can embrace it. So, you know, the first thing that many people have deployed over the last few years and are deploying now is active queue management. Anybody can do that. And then the ITF's new form of dual queue networking, totally open standard. The first three RFCs published last year. There are a few more that are published this year. Oh, totally <coughs> open. Anybody can adopt it, which is great. And starting to get built into open source. Yeah. And as you know, the uh, asymmetric older boxes, two and three systems work you can't have as much of an upload, and so what happens is when they reach that upload from a game, multiple different games, then the latency dramatically increases at like a thousand milliseconds as if you're talking about a fuse or something. So it's a, um, it, I think four is going to be a symmetrical, and that's going to resolve that issue, or will they even assign it? Even, even with symmetric gigabit service, you still can have high working latency because there's a bottleneck somewhere. Uh, folks like Nick might mention this in terms of the home network being one of those places, but even the gateway outbound in a symmetric service can in many cases be the source of that latency because you've got all these different types of cross traffic competing for network queuing. Yep. So next up, we've got uh, Dominique and Dr. Yes. Right. right. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. And um, thank you to all of you for coming here instead of the AI panel. <laughs> um, and I'm going to take you on a, a quick tour of net neutrality regulation. Um, despite what Jason just said about um, the new IETF standard uh, being uh, net neutrality friendly, um, it's important to understand that it, there are very few technologists in policy making <laughs> that, um, that understand how things work and understand emerging standards. And so I'm gonna, a, a lot of what we're talking about is still gonna be regulated in the EU and um, UK in particular, and also in the US as you're probably more familiar with um, under general net neutrality rules. Um, I'm, I'm from the UK, so I'm gonna spend a little more time on Europe and the UK, um, but I, a quick tour and hopefully five minutes. So um, I just wanted to point out that in, in the uh, European Union, um, the regulation is still, uh, the net neutrality regulation is still um, in force in all of the uh, European uh, countries, um, except for the UK, which had Brexit, which is why they have a different net neutrality uh, directive or regulation and not a directive. Um, just wanted to remind you about this because basically um, this is from 2015, and this particular paragraph talks about. Um, traffic management from a technical point of view, rather from preventing content or other kind of um, information from getting through in, in the service of net neutrality. It's an Article 3 if you're interested for the policy wonks. Um, and then, of course, uh, the European Commission last year had a consultation, um, and I, just the header of the consultations on this slide uh, there was um, a fair share campaign by uh, various telcos uh, in Europe to basically ask uh, another version of sender pays, but to ask platforms to pay for um, build out and content, um, which is really interesting because I think that's a direct result, probably many of you know, from, from heavy handed regulation, right? You know, freeing up regulation would be able to create more innovation around um, contracting and, and working with different parties. But, but the fact of the matter is that this is, this is what happened last year. Um, the European Commission had three takeaways, which we see also on this particular slide. We need more innovation and efficient investment, leveraging the single market and um, securing our networks. 
Um, so uh, the commission, and, and for many of you who may not be watching this, um, they have one more year left of a five-year term. There will be elections next year in Europe, European elections, um, and this will probably uproot and change all the work that's been done, but also change the direction because as the world is going, it looks like most of the people that will be elected next year will form, will come from center-right parties or right parties. So we'll have a completely different approach. Um, so the commission's kind of slowing down their work at the moment. Um, in the UK, this is where it gets interesting. In the UK, there was a consultation um, off the back of Brexit, um, and the results were basically after multiple consultations, results in October, basically turned over to industry the ability to offer premium services, specialized services, different types of uses of traffic management, both technical and for managing um, different, like gamers, you know, versus other things where they would be able to offer um, different rates depending on different people who want different things, um, and zero rating. I think the important thing here with the, what Ofcom, the regulator in the UK, has said is that they are not going, you know, we also need to clarify we're unlikely to have concerns where ISPs are taking reasonable approaches. So they're going to take their hands off and look for innovation in the market. Um, so one last slide, trying to be quick. <laughs> Where does that leave us with latency? Well, I think just hearing from Jason, I think we, and we'll hear from our other more technical panelists, uh, there's a clear misunderstanding of what latency is. Um, obviously, I think all of you and me just learning about it for this particular panel um, really doesn't understand how traffic management and how latency and the ITF standards and other standards can combine to actually even provide more efficiency. My, um, my proposal, obviously, would be to simplify regulation so that that innovation can occur, and there can be different partnerships, both with academic and other companies as well. Um, obviously, in the U.S., all of you are awaiting more uh, discussion on net neutrality coming up very soon, right? Um, and uh, again, in, in Europe, this will change significantly in the next year. But in the U.K., it's going to be interesting to see how, how what the recommendations that came out a few months ago will, uh, you know, play out. So that's it. Great. Thank you. Next, we have Mike all the way at the end. I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of, the, of an overview, like like Jason did, but I think we'll cover we'll cover different ground. So back in the kind of early part of the internet, if you were accessing a website of a company, like you might your traffic might literally go to the headquarters of the company in the basement on a server and then come come back to you. Um, and so a lot of things have changed, but at its core, a lot of what we do on the internet is a request for data. If you're issuing a request from your computer, it's literally called a, re a request for the website. That's gonna go out from your router, it's gonna go through a couple of routers at your ISP, and then eventually, it's gonna hopefully find the, the content or service that you requested at, at the data center. And there are some places in the U.S., like in the, in the Midwest and in the South primarily, where it could actually go across a couple of states before it reached a kind of regional data center that had a copy of the content uh, that, that you were looking for. There's a bunch of places in the world where it could travel across countries or, or across regions before it found the, the data that, that you're looking for. Um, and so that's, that's this diagram here. And then... What has happened over time is that CDNs have, have stood up and can cache a, con a copy of that content uh, closer to the end user. And so now that your request for the content goes out from your home, it hits the a, a same router or two with your ISP, but hopefully, um, and we're getting better at this, hopefully it can find the content in your local metro area. And that's, that's the idea, is we want to be able to, um, to it, just like going to the supermarket, you want it to be convenient, we want to be able to find as much content and services as possible, as close to the user as possible, literally so the data doesn't have to travel as far, and so it doesn't, it, it doesn't take as long. Uh, and so that's the role that, that CDNs play. I mean, it's not just about performance. There are security and, and reliability aspects of it too, but performance... Um, is, is a big one. And it's all in service of 
you know, re reducing that latency. And so a lot of, sometimes we fall into this trap of AR and VR needs really good latency. Gamers need really good latency. And, and uh, operating system uploads or, or downloads need really high bandwidth. But I, I want to try, to try to make the case that the, almost everything that we do on the internet is latency sensitive. Um, and so this is, this is a load of CNN.com. And I, I could have done weather.com, which is possibly the worst loading. Uh, <laughs> um, but CNN.com will, will do the job. And so if you see in here, the first request that it makes, I, I typed in CNN.com, but the web page is hosted at www.cnn.com. And so it was 300 milliseconds before that 301 redirect, the redirect from CNN.com to www.cnn.com got back to my browser. So now I know I need to load www.cnn.com. Now I need to get the HTML file. So I go back out to a server and get that, that file and it comes back to me. Now I need to know that I need to load a bunch of JavaScript files. And so it goes back out, gets those JavaScript files, brings them back in. Somewhere in there, it has enough data to load the web page, but there's a whole bunch of blocking round trip requests in, in there. And that, and so that really adds up. And the more we can compress that latency, the faster we can get this, this web page to load. Um, so let's see what this looks like with, with data. This is data from a great paper from some MIT researchers using the FCC's Measuring Broadband America program, which is itself a, a great data source. But it shows that above about uh, 20 megabits per second, that you're not, the web page is not loading any faster, the, the more throughput, the more bandwidth you apply to it. So I'm not gonna use the, the term speed. I, I have a allergic reaction <laughs> to the term speed to describe um, bandwidth. But this is a real data chart that shows that once that your gigabit connection is not is not helping you uh, load load web pages any faster. Compare that to the chart of what happens when you reduce latency, which is the same effect I was showing for CNN.com. It is a linear relationship. The the more we can reduce the latency, the faster the web page will load for the exact reason that we looked at uh, with with CNN.com, and that that relationship will hold true down down to almost zero uh, latency. You can speed up the web page. Um, and so, so, th so that's it. I, I think I, I'd like to close by saying I think that uh, it is any technology that we have that can reduce latency and improve internet performance is, is good to have. I think we're at the point in the United States where there's about 10% of uh, Americans that don't have access to a broadband connection. There's about 20% of Americans who aren't using the internet. There's probably a little bit more than that whose internet connection is kind of not, not good enough. As, as I start to think about how we apply policy to this, how we encourage um, better latency, I'm, I'm thinking about how can we make it so that, that as more Americans, as all Americans get enough throughput that they also have a really fast uh, internet connection in terms of the latency. <coughs> I'll, I'll leave it there. Great, thank you. Next up, we have Erwin. Thanks, Jason, and um, yeah, thanks for inviting me to the panel. Uh, so my name is Erwin Sakic, and I am with um, NVIDIA, um, where I work on the cloud streaming uh, service, uh, specifically for cloud gaming and uh, AR, uh, VR streaming applications. Um, and so I will give a perspective of an um, yeah, well, ever-growing um, service um, and what, how latency impacts us and how other aspects of transmissions over internet can impact uh, the, the streaming experience and the adoption of the service. Uh, I'll show some data to hope that in mind. Um, so for those who are unaware uh, what cloud gaming is and what cloud streaming is, uh, basic idea is that um, instead of having your um, game or some heavy workload executed locally, perhaps on your Mac, MacBook Air, some lightweight device, maybe your Android or iOS phone, 
we are basically offloading the calculations such as um, rendering of uh, game frames at perhaps 4K 120 FPS if you want to do so uh, away from your local device and instead put that workload in a server farm out there and basically let just um, let those frames be transmitted over to your local home network. And um, you, you are doing this over internet, which means it's an unreliable uh, link. It might work well in some, uh, some conditions, sometimes it does not, and we have to adapt to that. Uh, but the basic idea and premise here is um, you don't need to continuously upgrade your hardware, or your client um, hardware, in order to, 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 uh, to, to render the latest content that you might be interested in. Uh, and also you can save on the battery um, uh, life, for example, because you don't need to be, um, well, uh, you, don't, you don't need to execute uh, complex calculations anymore locally, uh, which again can, can provide for thin clients and deployment of complex applications on, on uh, thinner clients that we, that we might have with uh, today's um, uh, AR uh, devices, for example. Um, you don't need to carry a Tether battery with you, for example. Um, so uh, we, we support uh, different types of games here. So there's like 1,800 uh, games in the library. And there's also a CloudXR. It's a library which basically allows you to do the same for uh, stereo streaming for uh, uh, XR content, so AR and VR both. Um, and the GeForce Now is the uh, cloud gaming service that I'm talking about here. Uh, it's already supported in over 100 countries, and we have over 25 million users confirmed um, so far. And uh, we do host our own data center, so to minimize the latency aspect of it, if you think about an interactive service, any kind of input that you expect a response to, basically, or motion to photon latency uh, will impact your experience. And so you want to put those data centers as close to you as possible. So we had to distribute and have over uh, 30 physical uh, data center deployments around the world. And each of these will have at least uh, two to n different transit links. So to optimize for peering or provide for an uh, optimization peering between the ISPs. And we all also have points of presence as a different internet exchange points to, to minimize the latency. Um, and uh, I will show here how the latency can impact user experience. Um, so what we do after every single um, session, whenever a user starts a game ends it, us, they, they get offered basically uh, an optional rating step where they can rate their uh, service. And um, we do see a significant uh, inverse correlation here between uh, increasing the latency and the drop in the ratings. So basically as the uh, and I'm showing here on the x-axis the round-trip delays, which is basically our metric uh, for, for measuring um, end-time latency, specifically the percentile 99. Um, as it grows over to 400 milliseconds here, uh, the expected uh, rating will drop by 30%, uh, which basically indicates that users don't like latency, uh, they will rate it bad and might even jump away from the service if, if we end up being in that region which has very high latency. Fortunately, a uh, majority of our um, Sessions do stream at less than 100 milliseconds of percentile 99 latencies. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in business with the service. Uh, so, but there's still a very long tail here on the right. If you look, the distribution shows that there's still a bunch of sessions that end up with high latency numbers. And this is usually coming from home networks and uh, buffer flows and scenarios that, 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 that hit and result in high latency. Um, so for us, latency is also not just about networking. Um, there's a system latency involved. Um, I won't go into each of these boxes, but basically each of them are adding uh, latency in your end-to-end uh, -end, uh, flow. So uh, on server, for example, you might uh, need to capture the frame from a GPU. You might need to encode it and uh, packetize it and send it on the internet. And on the client side, you have to actually assemble that frame. You need to uh, post process if you need to upscale it, and you have to uh, uh, basically present it on your display, which uh, works with the variable refresh rate, and that refresh rate is adding uh, some latency. And in between all of that, you have the network where you have to transmit the packets in both directions because we also care about the you know the inputs, so the service is interactive. So um, all of this adds up to latency. Uh, what we can optimize well is the server and the client parts, so the, the edge parts. But the, um, uh, the network in between is something that is out of our control. Uh, and that's something that we can adapt to reactively when we observe network impairments. Um, but uh, we basically rely on the infrastructure providers to, 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 to uh, offer a, a decent or usable enough service here. 
Um, on the server and client side, we do things such as 240 FPS streaming to, min to like show you the latest uh, available frames or do things like frame pacing installing in the game engine so we can synchronize the monitor um, uh, refresh uh, timing with the uh, 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 frame render timing on the server side and things like that. But um, <coughs> network is what adds up uh, uh, a lot of latency. And uh, next to the last slide here, um, I'm basically showing here just a simplified example of, uh, of a connection. So we might have a streaming server, uh, like NVIDIA on the left, and some other service that's, that's uh, sending data in your, in your home network over internet. And on the very right, you see your home network could be connected over Wi-Fi or 5G, for example. Um, and um, when, once we start sending traffic, we have multiple points in the network that impacts us. Um, so one, uh, one, one is the, um, uh, the packet losses uh, that may come from, uh, from transit peering. Um, so if there's a bottleneck, there's a Super Bowl being streamed uh, during peak hours, for example, a lot of users watch it on your ISP, there's a high chance that you might encounter worse performance than usual if there's a bottleneck link there in the peering. And uh, on the right side, as we approach the edge where we stream data into the user's network, uh, we start seeing issues such as bottlenecks that Jason mentioned before, uh, that may be related to your plan. Um, you are trying to download more data into your home network than your plan actually provides. So you basically start buffering um, data in, in, in a queue. Uh, this adds up latency and is what we uh, usually call buffer bloat. Um, and uh, in order to, to get around that and minimize latency, there are mechanisms like just AQM that can be deployed. And on the very right side, we can also encounter latency and packet loss because of scheduling delays where your devices connect your um, uh, uh, gateway to, to the Wi-Fi router, for example, or GNOD being 5G context. Any interference or scheduling delays can also impact your uh, performance, and we need to uh, address all of these. Um, now, if we cannot do this and we lose some packets and we cannot assemble the frames, then we might need to do retransmissions that are super costly because you need to, uh, again, talk to your server get a new frame to reference in the future for, for the future frames, and this is uh, very latency uh, uh, demanding. Um, we can also do error concealment, but this results in, in picture distortion, and it's not an ideal case. And this is my last slide that I will show. Uh, so this is just an example of a game uh, called Fortnite, uh, streamed in the exact same bandwidth condition, the exact same network, um, uh, the only difference between the screen on the left and the right is that on the left, we don't have an uh, uh, AQM that's latency isolating. We don't have an active queue management mechanism that ensures that our service, that the responsive service gets low latency. Uh, whereas on the right, we have that L4S. And so what you see on the left is a lot of stutter and jumps and frame skips and decoder skips. Uh, making for a very unplayable or unenjoyable experience, uh, whereas on the right you see a super smooth stream. And the latency number on the top right, um, you see the spikes in the red on the left screen and no spikes on the right. Uh, this is basically uh, what we show to the users as an indicator that they have a latency issues, among other indicators. Um, for um, Yeah, and with that I will close out. I do have a couple backup slides in case we get to that later. But, um, Thank you. Yeah. Next up is Nick. All right, um, great, so thanks. Um, as Jason introduced, uh, I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Chicago. I work in uh, network measurement. Um, I've actually been working on designing, uh, de building and deploying uh, measurement systems since about 20, 2011, 2012, uh, since the early days of the Measuring Broadband America program. Uh, we had this system called, um, the Broadband Internet Service Benchmark, or Bismarck, that we, we uh, built that to measure throughput uh, way back when, when speeds were single-digit megabits per second downstream a lot of the time. Uh, DSL was still uh, fairly prevalent um, as an access mode. Um, uh, and uh, that project has, uh, has actually continued. Uh, we're still working on that. Uh, uh, in the same area today, but I'll, I'll sort of tell you about the arc of that project and how, uh, sorry to use the word speed, but um, how it's uh, really kind of evolved beyond just uh, throughput speed uh, in, the, in the traditional sense. Um, I should note, I know this panel's on latency, but I think even in the 2012 days, it, it, was, um, it became quickly apparent to me that me even measuring throughput is not a straightforward exercise. Um, 
Okay, enough said on that. I only have five minutes. Um, but uh, that, that certainly was a, an interesting journey in and of itself. I think um, it was around 2014, uh, was speaking with um, the, some of the folks who were invo uh, heavily involved in the Measuring Broadband America project at the time, Walt Johnson uh, being one of them, uh, came to me and, and said, hey, I think, um, I think in your work you, you might consider doing a web test because uh, I think you know, web, uh, web page load time uh, may actually stop correlating with throughput at some point. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about uh, the role of latency, uh, et cetera. I think, um, Mike, I don't know if that was, uh, that might have been my paper you cited actually. Um, uh, we, around 2014, 2015, we had a, a paper using, um, we actually helped um, the Sam Nose folks develop their web speed test and uh, deployed one of our own and saw that essentially web page load time stopped improving uh, around 20 megabits per second uh, down, uh, downstream. So kind of confirming, uh, confirming the hypothesis of those uh, like Walt. So that was kind of our first, uh, our first exposure to latency as a as sort of a primary uh, performance metric. That was like um, almost eight years ago now, eight or nine years ago. Um, and I think the story, the story has really continued from there and, and continued to, continue to evolve, I would say. Um, around that time, maybe a year or so later, uh, we were approached by some folks at the Wall Street Journal who, who said, hey, um, you know, we're getting a lot, of, like, a lot of people calling us talking about how um, people uh, are complaining about their video performance and... Um, they're getting advice to upgrade their 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 speed tier connections, and we we're not so sure that you know speed correlates with with video streaming quality uh, or video on demand uh, I should say quality after a certain point, and uh, <clears throat> so it's kind of the Walt Johnson story all over again, except I guess from the journalist consumer side and a different application, and uh, that was an interesting journey. Uh, because we we took on the question of how does how does str uh, streaming video on demand performance correlate with speed, uh, and when does that sort of, when does that correlation sort of cease to exist? And that turned out to be a very technically interesting question because if you're not the video service provider, figuring out things like frame rate, resolution, startup delay, uh, etc., actually a little bit challenging to do from network traffic. And we thought, oh, this won't be too bad. We'll just look at the dash. Uh, protocol. This should be straightforward, except um, thanks to folks like Jason and others, like a lot of network traffic at the time started to become encrypted. And so uh, that, that turned out to be a really interesting, um, in, interesting technical problem of how you, how you infer uh, things like video on demand performance from encrypted traffic. So we did manage to, kind of, uh, to, to crack that problem and uh, do another deployment where we then looked at, we used uh, so you're not in the AI panel, but you're going to get some AI. Um, we, we deployed some machine learning models to look at uh, encrypted traffic in about 60 homes, uh, mostly journalists um, in the New York City area, but a wide variety of uh, ISPs um, uh, looking at the correlation between uh, speeds, the throughput, excuse me, that we could measure uh, from those homes uh, correlated with um, video quality of experience for video on demand. And, um, Lo well, and behold, we saw the same kind of trend, except the, 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 the plateau wasn't at 20 this time. It was about you know, 100 or 200 megabits per second. Uh, you, you could really start to see a you know, plateau as far as the things that users cared about, startup delay, resolution, frame rate, et cetera. Um, and then I think that sort of brings me to chapter three, which is uh, right, uh, right now, I think, with the deployment of fixed fix 5G, uh, certainly the question, again, has, has come to the fore looking at, um, well, how does the performance of these kinds of networks uh, compare or relate to, to other modes of access? And um, as part of that, I think all of the things that I've talked about kind of led up to um, not only we continue to be active in our research on this, but in a commercial venture that, that, we've, that we've started, we're also exploring uh, what the market looks like as far as um, different modes of access. And... Um, a lot of interesting results there, I'll say, re related to latency under load and responsiveness uh, as it relates to the, to the fixed 5G space. So I think for this audience in particular, um, I'll say that 
Um, it, it would certainly appear that um, some of those fixed 5G providers are showing significantly higher latencies and latency under load, um, lower responsiveness uh, than our uh, than our wireline providers, and so it's it's really incumbent uh, to be looking at uh, these metrics that we're hearing about in this panel as uh, as part of the whole uh, user experience package. Um, Okay, I think just a couple of closing notes since I'm, I'm at time. I think um, uh, I think one of the things I've learned from from my um, my journey in this space over the last ten or twelve years is that um, the the applications evolve, the network infrastructure evolves, uh, and um, certainly we're seeing right now that. Uh, the importance of measuring along performance along multiple dimensions is extremely important. Um, but again, I think the needs uh, of, of consumers continue to evolve applications. You know, we're seeing Vision Pro and other things now. Um, uh, these are things that maybe we could have predicted, but we might not have been able to quite predict the specific ways to measure the network to assess what user quality of experience or user experience really is. And so I think there's a real, uh, it's incumbent on our community to uh, design uh, um, measurement platform suites that are extensible, open source, uh, and also allow us to, um, to gain access to, to public data so that we can, we can really see how these networks are, are performing. Great, thank you. So we've got a little bit less than 20 minutes left. I've got some directed questions I'm gonna ask our panelists and then we'll take uh, questions from the audience. Um, the first one is about measurement of this problem. And I think really Mike and Nick are kind of the authorities um, here that have done a lot of measurement um, over the years. I know Cloudflare you know, has a, a good speed test. You, know, <laughs> you don't like that name. And it, that data set is now, I think, being integrated into uh, the MLabs um, data store, which is interesting. And Cloudflare, uh, Cloudflare also has something called Radar, um, which is a website that you can look up different networks and their quality and so on. And I know, Nick, you've looked a lot, particularly lately, uh, about Wi-Fi networks being the bottleneck in Correct. a lot of cases. Yeah. So, you know, question to the both of you, you know, what interesting things have you seen? Nick, you mentioned one of them being, you know, difference between uh, wireless and wireline networks, but what would be interesting from a, a measurement standpoint since, you know, mostly these days everybody is just aware of the speed test and really nothing else? Um, you mentioned the, the, the Wi-Fi bottleneck uh, issue. That's another one that I guess thanks for the opportunity to talk about that. Um, Another thing that we've we've done over the past, I guess, four or five years is develop tests that's, that concurrently measure the user's Wi-Fi with the speed test that's running essentially off the off the home router, and um, obviously um, the, the situation is going to depend on the home. But I think that's actually kind of the point <laughs> is that is that uh, a user's home network setting can have. Uh, significant effects on their experience. Um, um, I don't have the, the specific statistic at hand uh, right now, but it's, it's roughly what you would expect as far as, um, as, far as Wi-Fi bottlenecks. Uh, I will say that in, as part of our work, like we've, we've, done, um, we've done a bunch of deployments in, in hundreds of homes across uh, the United States in the last five years, I'll say, and um, uh, once again, I, I think um, once speeds get above about a, a gigabit per second, it's it's almost exclusive in our measurements that the the, the user's performance bottleneck is actually inside the home um, for for throughput. I'm speaking about, um, and then even you get to slightly lower speed tiers than that or speeds, um, and it's still by and large uh, the Wi-Fi that's actually a, a limiting factor. And I, I think we could certainly talk a lot more about about that. I guess just briefly what I would say is we're, we're measuring the, the kind of application latency between somebody requesting uh, our content and our services and, and kind of the round trip time to get back to them. Um, there, are, there are places in, in the world where a, a new pop, a new, a new data center that tracks that traffic is 
it's just totally transformative to the internet experience because the, the traffic is in kind of leaving countries and, and continents. I think in the U.S. we have a we're in a better position on that. Yet still, um, you know, here's an example. There, a couple of years ago, the city of Montgomery, Alabama, launched an internet exchange, and they put a the city put a whole bunch of time and effort and a, a little money, not too much, but a little bit of money, into um, in, into that that internet exchange, and th that has the ability if it attracts enough networks, if it attracts content and services networks on one side, if it attracts internet service providers on the other side. To make it such that somebody in Montgomery, Alabama can find their streaming game or anything else in, in their local market and their, their traffic isn't backhauled to Atlanta or Dallas. Um, and the same, that's hap that, that happens in the South and, and it also is happening uh, quite a bit in the Midwest, in, in Iowa and the Dakotas and, and some of those states that the traffic has to kind of go a great distance. And so I'd say one of the things that we can measure is what what is the latency by by ISP and then by state to make sure that 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 is one of the things that's taken into consideration as we deploy new networks. Yeah, that's a really good point, especially given the FCC's focus on middle mile grants, um, you know, through the BEAD program. And you know this need in the you know the content to get sort of hyper local so that it's the shortest round trip time. Um, so moving on, um, you know, Erman, I, I wonder what you think about um, not just the the customer impact when you're say gaming and you encounter this high latency, but what other kinds of applications, you know, from your standpoint become possible. You know, we've got someone that's, uh, you know, here from Apple, they have the Vision Pro headset, which is <laughs> taking the world by storm. And, you know, you have older generations of other companies that, you know, people describe like VR motion sickness and these kind of things. Yeah. So what do you think in terms of applications that become, you know, really possible now in the future with ultra low latency? Okay. So um, I mentioned before that AR, VR, a use case where we're basically streaming the app itself, including um, some production tools. Um, we have a product there called Omniverse, uh, basically for like 3D modeling, CAD uh, type of applications, streaming that in low latency uh, um, properties, I'm sure high throughput, high fidelity, uh, and possibly also to an AR, uh, uh, VR enabled device, so to an HMD um, like provision. At the, something like this becomes possible once you can guarantee below 20 milliseconds uh, round trip delays and ideally a sub 10 milliseconds uh, latencies. Another interesting application is teledriving, for example, um, where uh, there's a startup called Bay, um, which has demonstrated recently also an example of L4S with, I believe, Ericsson and Deutsche Telekom that it's possible to have kind of a semi-autonomous solution uh, to, to resolve today's issues around AVs. Uh, so the, basically, their use case is you deliver a, you know, a, a rental car uh, to, to your place and you pick it up uh, while having a remote connection, remote driver also in the loop that's capable of reacting faster than uh, or with, with the, some responsibility and the person in the loop uh, given the, if the network is also supporting it. Uh, I don't think we are quite there, so that, that it's a wide, uh, uh, that the network widely enables us today, but they have already demonstrated it on different streets in Europe, uh, for example, with an L4S and uh, uh, 5G GNOB setup. Um, and I think that said, um, cloud gaming is growing um, for, uh, for us. And one, I think, important observation there that we kind of miss often is you don't always need the, the lowest latency at all the times. Uh, what very much matters for us for good experience is consistent latency. Uh, so jitters and latency variation uh, makes for a very um, unpredictable service and performance. Like I mentioned uh, motion to photo latency before. When a user clicks, when you make a, you know, a keyboard type uh, and you expect a, a, a feedback uh, loop to kick in at some specific time in the future, uh, this doesn't work if you have constantly a spikes in your latency. So even though your average latency might be low, uh, any spikes will give for an intermediate poor performance and poor experience. Uh, so uh, for us, uh, consistent experience is very important. And again, depending on the content, it also becomes obvious if you're playing you know, a strategy game, some like slow content or even some professional, like, professional visualization application versus streaming a first-person shooter, 
you might be perfectly fine with having, you know, 60, 70 milliseconds fixed latency uh, versus, you know, having low latency at the times, but then spiking up to two, 300 milliseconds in between. So predictably low latency. Pr predict mm. at, 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 at least yeah. predictable moderate latency yeah. uh, is, is uh, yeah, what, what can make for a decent experience. Ideally, we will always have a low latency and have it a consistent. Um, Upstream latency matters too. Uh, this is uh, in contrast to something like Netflix um, that might be, you know, serving the content which might be slightly buffered, but you want to deliver it as fast as possible. So benefits from latency, but for for us, upstream bottlenecks are also very important. So if you have, and we do see a lot of asymmetric deployments uh, in terms of bandwidth um, in 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 uh, the US, which is uh, also a technology limitation uh, to, to some extent, but. Uh, having AQMs and mechanisms that enable low latency on upstream is very critical for these uh, kinds of yep. applications because there's an input involved there. Yeah, and that's a good point to mention AQMs, which for those of you that don't know what that is, that's active queue management. <laughs> it's a form of uh, TCP congestion control, and network equipment can embrace that and, and uh, deploy it now. Um, Comcast has it deployed in our gateways. Um, and cable modems, um, other people can do it. Hmm. And, you know, there's lots of variety of AQMs. <coughs> Pi is one of them. Um, Doxus has an implementation of that. There's FQCodal and others that exist out there. And, and so there are things people can do in particular to, um, you know, try to improve their network now. Um, I'd like to go to one last question before we open up to the audience. Um, and this is one really for Dominique um, about the policy implications that you talked of a little bit ago. And I can tell you from somebody who's been at Comcast for a while, um, my uh, sort of baptism by fire in the tech world was the BitTorrent incident, so to speak, <laughs> when we had a little bit of a problem with peer-to-peer -peer traffic. Mm. And um, as it turns out, as we understand it now, that was a working latency problem. That was buffer mm. boot, um, just completely misunderstood, solved in a bizarre way that didn't, wasn't great. So lots of lessons learned. Um, in a difficult way, but as a result, now we have net neutrality, um, uh, thankfully, right? So I guess you can you can really blame latency for that. But what are your thoughts um, about this? Like, is it ultimately, especially in the European and UK mm. context, is that a specialized service? Is or is it just you know because it's applications embracing it and marking their mm. traffic for it? Does it become you know just sort of an okay thing? Because since mm. we know that you know Europe and the UK are always sort of further you know, on the spectrum of regulation. Yes, that's true. Um, thanks. Uh, just one comment I want to make on IXPs. I, I've been able to see just in Africa and some of the sub-Saharan countries just going from zero to one IXP, how much of a difference that makes. I mean, we're lucky here, but it's unbelievable, especially around just getting content. And I, I just wanted to highlight that because it's been incredible to see that. But thanks on the, on the policy and regulation side. Um, I, uh, so a couple of things I, I have to say, and I sort of hinted at it. Um, you know, the regulation is old, right? That's why there's been consultations in Europe and the UK um, most recently. But in Europe, the regulation is old. Like, this wasn't really even an issue back then. Um, and as we have more VR coming on board, there was a working group on autonomous vehicles within uh, Europe most recently. All of this is post-2015. <laughs> Um, for the directive. Again, each country within Europe um, puts the directive into their law in a different way. There's quite strict net neutrality laws in, um, in, a, in the Netherlands, for example. And so you'll see different, and there's more technologists, I would say, that have worked on the law. So it's really quite a very different um, approach depending on the country. Um, however, I think that... It, you know, most of this is seen as active as uh, active technical tra um, a traffic management, um, and I think that as all of you work um, on developing uh, more and different ways to manage traffic, I think you know engaging with policymakers is going to become ever more important um, throughout global rollout, but also throughout you know 5G, 6G rollout, which is coming. The 6G standards are starting. And then again, the impact and effect on not just Starlink, but other, you know, providers, satellite providers. I mean, I know that I spend most of the summer using 
Starlink, right? So how is that going to impact me or how am I going to be able to use that? And so there's, there's multiple technology questions that have multiple policy implications. Um, but I think with the review, like what the UK undertook and the approach that it's taken, it has some pretty solid and quite, uh, quite good engineers internally at Ofcom, but also they liaise quite closely with their industry um, because it's just a smaller country more than anything else. Um, you're starting to see the understanding of having flexible regulation um, that has... I don't like to say, you know, level playing field, but has a pretty low sort of, um, uh, you know, monitor or level of regulation where you really can do innovation. So I think what comes to mind when it comes to this is like, I think about a content provider, you know, having CDNs or working, you know, within a local community and, and how they are able to contract financially and how they're able to set up their terms and being able to provide that flexibility for each of those companies as the technology changes is really, really important. So the bottom line answer is I think net neutrality is what's regulating it, but I don't think it's necessarily appropriate anymore. Okay, great. <laughs> so, so questions from the audience. Um, what do you want to know? What, are you, what questions do you have? We've got two folks right here. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Uh, I have two questions. I don't know if I can ask both or just one. Um, <laughs> the first one relates to uh, what Ermin showed about AQM in the context of a home network, so a private network. Uh, Jason, you just explained that um, ISPs can deploy AQM uh, in order to improve traffic management. How can the orchestration of different um, requests for different AQM classes, I guess, work in a way that, that keeps this loose coupling that you described between applications and networks, and how is that consistent or not consistent with different views of net neutrality? Right. That's the first question. And if I may, just the second question um, was more for Nick around the comment you made about 5G FWA networks potentially exhibiting higher latency under load. Mm -hmm. This morning, Commissioner Carr said, uh, whatever we, we do, we need to be tech neutral, and obviously, one of the questions is, how do you, can you specify latency and the load thresholds in order to uh, preserve tech neutrality and yet mm. get the performance that we want to get from gigabit networks? Thanks. Got it. So I'll, I'll tackle the first one about the marking. The way that it works, there are two different um, ITF standards for how you mark. One is in the ECN packet, part of the packet header, and the other is the DSCP part of the packet header. And any application can mark. It's documented um, in the uh, ECN part in uh, three RFCs and the uh, other part for DSCP coming soon. Um, I think the internet draft is on probably the 18th iteration. Um, so really, any application can, can just apply those marks in the client. Um, and then any network hop that implements that standard will put it into this separate queue. Um, and so, you know, totally open from that standpoint. And then um, the, the second question was around 5G fixed wireless. Anything in particular about tech neutrality? I noticed, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> even though the bandwidth is good, you've noticed in your measurements, like, yeah. substantially different and highly variable latency. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm going to get ejected from the city for saying this, but uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that, that, that phrase is, is ridiculous. I mean, that's like saying, <laughs> oh, uh, let's be... Let's be tech neutral. We should we should consider carrier pigeon and and you know old school modems and DSL as well. If the if the performance metrics don't line up uh, to things that deliver a good user quality of experience, uh, then that needs to be front and center. I mean, yeah, we I, I think there's a difference between saying let's not put our thumb on the scale for one technology versus another as far as maybe regulation or, or you know, um, uh, yeah, as, as far as regulation is concerned. But it's a, it's a completely different thing to pretend that these are one and the same technology, type of technology, delivering the same experience for users because at the moment they're not. And so, um, yeah, sure, I mean, there, there's, I'm sure there are a lot of smart people working on on improving latency for fix wireless technology, but I can tell you right now from what I see, it's, it's not there yet. So next question, we had Harold in the queue. So I'm going to ignore net neutrality entirely 
and, and focus on my other obsession, which is Wi-Fi and unlicensed spectrum, um, <laughs> where I was very interested to hear about something we all sort of generically know, which is the problem inside the home network, where increasingly it is, number one, impossible to find devices that don't have Wi-Fi uh, uh, capability where the default is that it is on so that it can report back to various motherships about how many times I run my washing machine or whatever. Um, and the uh, just the, the number of devices like these pads and, and phones that won't connect to a... Uh, um, I'm curious, um, is there, number one, a way within the Wi-Fi protocols itself? Is it something that you go to Wi-Fi forward and say, hey, for Wi-Fi 8, can there be some kind of traffic load management that, you know, yeah. works to help uh, uh, reduce the latency um, as we you know, move across the, uh, the networks here? Um, or is this a, if people are going to insist on doing this, we're going to need bigger channel sizes, mm -hmm. which has been the solution of Wi-Fi 6 and yeah. Wi-Fi 7, which means finding more uh, unlicensed spectrum that can be used for, uh, for Wi-Fi routers. Yeah, I, I think there may be some, a few answers there. One, a lot of the Wi-Fi standards to date have been heavily optimized towards maximizing throughput, like many things, right? Um, and so the, the current versions of Wi-Fi do have a notion of different... Uh, sort of priorities. There's best effort and video and voice and, and background. Um, but that's really just, you know, um, relative priority, like quality of service, not really low delay. Um, it is something that, you know, there is in discussion for future versions of the standard. And I hope that we'll see more alignment between the sort of marking that IEEE uses and IETF use. You know, so that, that's sort of one of those challenges. But I would say, in, to your first question, probably the most important part is more Wi-Fi spectrum, more unlicensed spectrum. I think you could have a huge impact on, you know, everyday Americans' internet performance by having more access to unlicensed Wi-Fi spectrum. That's the primary way that every single device connects. Even if you think about a mobile phone, like on our network with Xfinity Mobile, something like 80 or 90 percent of the time, that is connecting over a Wi-Fi network, not over a 5G network. Um, so I think all of that argues for, you know, a lot more unlicensed spectrum in the home and, you know, as a really important um, aspect. Any other comments on Wi-Fi? I mean, just even with the C-band, we don't have the C-band problem that you have here in Europe. I mean, just even releasing some of this C-band will actually free up a lot more innovation, I think. Um, you know, and it's kind of a little bit of a shocker to see that that's still a discussion yeah. <laughs> when I come over. So we've got a couple more questions over here. Go ahead, so yes. Um, so lunch <laughs> is starting now in the main atrium, yep. but I think we have time for one more question. All right, we've got one one final question. <laughs> Nick, you were a button pusher. I've been running a fixed wireless network for 25 years, so thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason we haven't been scaling is because the FCC has been allowing all of the spectrum to go to the licensed carriers. In fact, the $3 billion record sale they made to Verizon Three months later, a G. Pai, their lawyer, who was the chairman, gave them $5 billion grant. So you can't tell me that it's fair. They've been making sure that fixed wireless couldn't grow because we already have the customers and corporate is doing their best to take it over. But you can't always blame the ISP either. Much of the um, modern latency is old computer operating systems, 100 megabit cards, Ethernet cards and computers, improper placement of home routers, and, of course, we play the game with Okula where we do bursting so that they have their own speeds. And, of course, Okula itself doesn't work because it only uses available bandwidth. And the only people who run available bandwidth tests is when they're gaming or streaming. So it shows extremely low, which is the way to show that it doesn't work. Really, industry programmers, regulatory agencies need to stop the pendulum swing of excessive control. Net neutrality is throwing 1934 laws on internet providers who were lightly um, touched before. There's a, something at the FCC uh, called the uh, B permitting that simply makes sure that you make sure that the uh, you're not slowing down people between technologies like Apple does with their texting to Android and things like that. We need to, that's the kind of stuff that we need to work towards. And the people who are the uh, technical industry people need to be making um, true assessments of speed and looking at the uh, uh, user, the home user uh, capabilities at all, because now the FCC wants to call 
uh, an inability for a customer to get the speed, digital discrimination, and they can sue us. So I could get a slap suit, wipe out a community ISP, and that's one less competitor against the corporate giants. All right. Um, any uh, reactions or comments in our one minute? Yeah, I'll just respond to that. So um, it wouldn't be a panel without a little controversy. Um, <laughs> but I, I think um, I, I think it's uh, I enjoyed your comments actually because uh, I, as a measure, as a, someone who does performance measurement, I see the out, outcomes and outputs. But I think your comments were really on. Uh, you know, the shape of the industry and the, in the, in the context and the inputs and like what results in what we see on, on, on the out, on the outcomes, uh, which is something that I don't spend a lot of time thinking about. And I think like one of the, th I, I, just to sort of get back on my own soapbox, I think one of the things that, um, that I hope is that, that measurements, uh, that we can all kind of agree on are, 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 a good representative set of like what users are seeing from different providers, um, that might actually help uh, everybody tell their story. Everybody seems to have a different story to tell, a different agenda, um, except I think maybe we can all agree that improving the user experience is one that, that we'd, like to, we'd like to all achieve. Cool. Well, thank you to all of my panelists. Really appreciate your time and your travel today. Uh, thank you also to our audience. I was very impressed. No one fell asleep. That's a really big, <laughs> big deal. Um, but lunch is available outside and happy to take any questions that you may have uh, afterwards. Oh, and there's, uh, so I'm told there's a salons later um, and you can sign up outside of the North Room. See, I got that right. That's great. Um, and uh, if you're interested in that, that's where you sign up. I don't know what they're discussing, but you can find out, I'm sure, on the agenda. Thank you. <laughs>